The original plan was for Hitman to be an ongoing episodic platform, which would continue to bolt more missions on every few months. The first season included the maps which I've spoken about so far, including the summer bonus missions. There was also an additional bonus mission called Landslide released as a part of this pack, and the Christmas holiday event map Holiday Hoarders, both of which we'll talk about in another video. After those six maps were released, Square Enix rebundled the game as a $60 retail package, called Hitman The Complete First Season. Unfortunately, while reception to the game was universally positive, earning Game of the Year awards from sites such as Giant Bomb and a devoted cult following, Square Enix deemed the sales of the game disappointing, and decided to sell off IO Interactive. I don't want to sit here and armchair quarterback about what exactly went wrong with Hitman the Complete First Season from a business standpoint. There have been a lot, a lot, a lot of words written on how Square Enix failed this game, and it still feels like a legitimate miracle that the trilogy actually managed to continue at all. Suffice to say that IO Interactive actually managed to buy themselves away from Square Enix, and break off from their owners, a move which I remember making me and a lot of other people who follow the games industry go, huh, I didn't know that could happen. What seems like even more of a miracle is that IOI actually kept the Hitman license, and immediately announced plans to continue development on Hitman's second season, this time as a full $60 package released all at once, titled Hitman 2. But Hitman 2's development was clearly delayed by the entire kerfuffle, and nearly a year passed with no solid word on the sequel's development. Instead, in late 2017, IOI announced that they would be re-releasing Hitman's first season once again as a $60 package, now titled Hitman Game of the Year Edition, rather than Hitman the Complete First Season. The profits for the re-release would go directly to IOI, rather than Square Enix getting paid as the publishers of the Complete First Season. For people who didn't follow this situation, who have wondered why there are a series of increasingly baffling game and DLC titles like Hitman First Season Pass, Hitman The Complete First Season, Hitman Game of the Year Edition, and Hitman Game of the Year Upgrade Pack, this is why. Buckle up folks, the DLC titles are only going to get more baffling from here. In order to incentivize players who had already bought the complete first season into double-dipping on Game of the Year Edition, the Game of the Year Edition came with a new campaign consisting of four remix levels, of about the same scope as the levels from the Summer Bonus Missions pack. These four missions, rather than being standalone mini-stories like the Summer Bonus Missions, form one storyline, called Patient Zero, with each mission leading directly into the next. I've always felt kind of conflicted about the Game of the Year edition... existing. I really empathize with IOI wanting a cash infusion to make it to Hitman 2's release, and look, if it's what you had to do, it's what you had to do. But selling the campaign as a re-release of the game which had come out with a similar bundled pack just a year earlier began the game's path of DLC getting really, really confusing. These games have a real reputation for being baffling and hard to just... buy? In any case, they did also sell the Patient Zero campaign as DLC, so you can just buy the Game of the Year Edition upgrade now, or, preferably, the packs which import all of the Hitman 1 content into Hitman 2 or Hitman 3, so it's not so much of an issue anymore. If this is what was necessary to get us to Hitman 2, it's ultimately a good thing in my book. Let's talk about these missions, beginning with the first in the campaign, The Source. The Patient Zero campaign was released November 7th, 2017. The first mission in the campaign is titled The Source, and is set on a nighttime variant of the Bangkok map at the Hotel Himapan. The mission briefing for The Source tells you about your targets, two members of a cult called Liberation, who are planning a bioweapon attack in Bangkok. A reclusive millionaire going by the alias of Loxley has hired Agent 47 and Diana to take out the cult's leadership and stop the attack from taking place. The leader of the cult is a man by the name of Oybek Nabazov, and is the primary target of the mission. His second-in-command, Sister Yildiz, is the secondary target. The cult have set up a staging ground for their attack at the Hotel Himapan, under the pretense of having rented out the Queen Suite for an art exhibition titled A Study of Life, Death, and Rebirth Viewed Through the Lens of Atrocity. The attack is in its final stages of planning, so you must go to the art exhibit and find a way to take out Nabazov and Sister Yildiz there to try to prevent it. The source is a less extensive overhaul than the previous two bonus missions we've looked at, 
a house built on sand, and the icon felt like completely new missions. None of the notable NPCs shared routines, none of the dialogue was the same, and so on. The changes made to the map for the Source, on the other hand, are mainly limited to the Queen Suite, with minor changes being made to other areas throughout. The biggest change to the map overall is that it's now set at night, giving the level a different vibe. Most of the NPCs and geometry outside the Queen Suite is unchanged, however. There are some signs advertising the art exhibition posted around the hotel, and the Emperor Suite is still populated by sound crew from the class, but this time also hotel staff, as they seem to be tearing down the equipment and cleaning the room, a detail which sets this mission shortly after Club 27 chronologically. The staff area behind the hotel has much higher security than it did in Club 27, and is being guarded by some kind of private militia, with disguises like hotel security or hotel staff not being allowed there, the reason for which will become more obvious a little later. The Queen Suite, on the other hand, has received a complete overhaul, turning it into an art exhibition. Large screens are displayed on either side of the room, preventing easy access to the side rooms, which are off limits to anyone but wait staff and cult members. The screens are mostly displaying eerie imagery, or quotes from Nabozov on death. There are pedestals throughout the room holding pictures, flowers, human skulls, and weapons like the amputation knife and the circumcision knife. A bust of a devil has coin offerings placed in front of it. The entire thing is extremely superficial, which you can hear the NPCs looking around the gallery commenting on, saying there doesn't seem to be much of a message. Perhaps the superficial surface is an ironic comment. Probably not. The side rooms have catering tables and some waiters, cultists, and cult bodyguards patrolling around. Upstairs, the garden area has been converted into a ritual space, where cult initiates meditate and wait for Napazov to come speak to them. Nabozov will periodically perform a ritual here, where he sticks his arms into the flames and pulls them away unburned, a display of power to his followers. Of course, it's a trick, one he pulls off by coating his arms in a flame retardant second before performing the ritual, in a small area just outside the garden, off limits to everyone but cult bodyguards, Sister Yildiz, and Nabozov. The rest of the Queen Suite's top floor is essentially unchanged with the only major difference being a few scattered cult bodyguards keeping watch or patrolling. Nabazov plays the part of True Believer. One thing I haven't mentioned in the series so far is that in the menu used to plan missions, you can get brief character bios about your targets, providing some additional information about them. Nabazov's bio describes him as a serial cult leader, who has been tied to several ritual suicides in the past. Nabazov wanders around the gallery rambling about death, and providing his alleged wisdom to the room. What a fine day, sir. Oh, mystic forces you shall retain over the blood and over the brain, and the footsteps you hear will be the last to reach your dying ear. Sister Yildiz, on the other hand, seems to be the far more pragmatic of the two. In her character bio, she's essentially described as the one who keeps things in the cult running behind the scenes, while Nabazov is the charismatic leader who ropes gullible followers in. Her bio also mentions that she's made huge investments in several pharmaceutical companies recently, the sort of investments that would have huge, huge returns if a bioterror attack were to take place, or a plague began to spread. She's playing both sides working with the Liberation Cult to develop a virus, and investing in pharmaceutical companies to profit once it's been unleashed. If Nabazov is killed, Sister Yildiz will panic and drop the grand charade of the cult. First, she'll make a quick call on her phone. Then, we'll go meet one of the militia members hanging out at the hotel bar. She'll tell the militia member that something has happened to Nabazov, and that they need to escape before things go bad. What's the situation here? Something happened to the old fool, and the rest of them are unstable. I'm pretty certain his plan will kick off automatically now. We need to get clear. All right. We can go. She'll then be escorted to the militia-controlled evacuation area behind the hotel, which is a much, much more difficult place to take her out, especially since once the militia have moved her there, it will be even more heavily guarded than it was before. That covers the changes to the map and the targets, so let's move on to talking about some of the ways to take the targets out. There are no mission stories in the Patient Zero campaign, so instead I'll be talking about notable kills in each mission, usually marked by challenges. 
One challenge, called Weapon of Choice, requires you to kill Sister Yuldus with one of the pieces in the exhibition, either the amputation knife or the circumcision knife. There's a challenge called Purgatory to kill both targets with poison. This challenge doesn't actually require you to bring any poison pills with you. Recall that there's a jar of poison pills available in one of the hotel rooms in the North Tower. There's also a new jar of poison pills, which has been added in the bathroom of the Queen Suite, where two cult initiates can be seen arguing. There are two glasses of wine at the exhibition, which Sister Yulduz and Nabazov drink from, respectively. Sister Yulduz drinks from one directly next to one of the curtains leading into the cultist-only side of the bottom floor, and Nabazov drinks from one on a cart inside of that room. Just make sure you kill Yulduz first, so she doesn't leave the exhibition when Nabazov dies. As a part of his route through the exhibition, Nabazov will light incense in front of the screens, while saying a few words. On the other side of one of these screens, there's a gas canister. If you take out the waiters in the area, you can use a wrench to cause a leak here, which will cause Nabazov to blow himself up the next time he lights incense in front of the screen, awarding the challenge Deadly Incense. My favorite kill in the level is tied to a challenge called Divine Intervention. In front of the hotel, you can hear two members of the hotel staff complaining that the cultists keep asking for more fire extinguishers. That axe-faced Haridan demanded more fire extinguishers this morning. What are they doing up there? Up on the top floor. Some sort of new age ritual, I think. Bunch of one percenters looking for truth in crystal balls. Up at the exhibition, you can hear two waiters discussing the same thing, and why the cult needs them. So, I know why they want so many fire extinguishers. I wondered about that. Those things are lethal. So, that Nabazov guy does this miracle, waving his hand through torches. Calls it the fire touch or something. What, like actual fire? Doesn't he get burned? No, that's the thing. It's a miracle. No, it's not really. No, he has this bowl of stuff he puts on his hands. Fire retardant or something. Damn. A tricky blighter. That's the kind of thing you read about in the newspapers. I mean, when it goes wrong. You can also hear two waiters discussing a bottle of 92 proof highly flammable vodka, which was accidentally left downstairs in the kitchen. Damn, where's the 151 vodka? I need it for my flambéed oysters. Come on, just use cognac or something. What am I, a barbarian? Those classless toads won't notice. They must have left it in the restaurant. Fine, they'll just have to eat it raw. If you go down to the kitchen and get the bottle of vodka, and then make your way up to the bowl of flame retardant next to the fire seance ritual room, you can fill the bowl with the highly flammable vodka, causing Nabazov to burn himself to death the next time he performs the ritual. No, 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 no. Another notable way of taking Nabazov out is by attending his ritual as a cult initiate. Nabazov will ask to see you in private, letting you take him out. Let me speak freely, children. There is someone here with us who has very recently lit the flame, a true servant of death. Will you make yourself known? I'm the one you're looking for, Mwalim. Yes. You are new among us, but I sense you know death better than most. Would you speak with me alone? Stay I come here to center myself. The water and the fire are opposites. Much like the cycle of life and death, don't you think? In my experience, Mualim, life is a straight line with a sudden end. You have much to learn, my child. I shall say the words for you. If you feel it necessary. Two extremely similar challenges are called Penetrating Art and Two Birds with One Sniper Rifle. Penetrating Art requires the player to take a sniper rifle and shoot Nabazov from the opposite suite, where the sound crew and hotel staff are actively cleaning. Two Birds with One Sniper Rifle requires you to kill both targets at once from the opposite suite. This requires you to bring a sniper rifle into the level, which is capable of penetrating bodies, very few of which are also silenced. I used the Golden Dragon here, 
which is one of the few sniper rifles that has both of these traits. Either way, these challenges will require you to first clear out the opposite penthouse, or at least thin the herd of NPCs cleaning there, and then snipe through one window, through a window on the opposite side, while Nabazov is in front of one of the screens. Since they are only fabric screens, you can easily shoot through them, and if you have a penetrating sniper rifle, you can even shoot from one end of the map to the other, through both screens and both bodies, when Nabazov and Sister Gildus are briefly lined up. Taking Sister Gildus out once she's been escorted behind the hotel is a lot harder than taking her out at the exhibition. My favorite way of doing it is by first getting a militia soldier disguise, and then picking up one of the propane flasks nearby. Sister Yulduz is completely stationary once she's been moved behind the hotel, and so it's easy to set a propane flask or two right next to her without raising any suspicion. Two shots to the propane flask will blow her up. Next, let's talk about some of the details hidden in the source. You can hear two guests in the South Tower by the bar discussing the art exhibit. Sir, did you sneak up to that exhibition on the third floor? No, I decided against it. I mean, I love art as much as the next person, but there was just too much talk about death. It creeped me out. And not to mention those cult-looking types. I told you. I thought this was supposed to be a top-notch establishment. Frankly, I'm very disappointed they'd let in people like that. If you enter the bathroom of the Queen Suite from the art exhibition, you can hear a couple arguing. They're two cult initiates, but half of the couple has gotten cold feet, seeing how hardcore the cult is, while the other is urging him to join. You can't pull out now. We talked about it. You wanted to do it too, remember? Rebecca, have you heard what he's talking about? This is not some little wellness getaway. I have a horrible feeling about this. Well, I'm doing it. And if you love me, you'll do it with me. I mean, we've got the tattoos and everything. That's not fair. Please, let's leave together now. No, go and get your stuff from the room and join me in the garden. And if you don't, I'll know you don't love me. No, I'm not doing this. If you go, you go without me. You coward, Jeff. If you knock this guy out, he'll drop a room 206 key card. If you go down to room 206, you can find a cult initiate disguise in the room. Nabazov and Sister Yulduz will periodically meet. Nabazov will check in with her on how progress is going, releasing the virus into the city of Bangkok. Sister Yulduz, it is all as I have foreseen. Are you prepared to take the flame into the city? Mualim, yes. I have prepared everything. After these check-ins, Sister Yulduz will go to the private office nearby and let her facade as a cultist drop during a phone call, where you can hear her trying to make plans to get out of the cult. It's me. What's going on with the transactions? I know you think the market is going to rise. I have a different opinion on that. Let me know when you've done it. If you follow Nabazov to the kitchen of the Queen Suite, you can hear him make a call to Craig Black, one of the targets of the next mission in the campaign, the author. Hello, Craig. It is the teacher. Are you prepared? Liberation beckons. When the time comes, I shall send a brother to you with the flame, and you will carry it into the world. We shall meet again in the shadow of Khazrat Sultan. One challenge, titled At Ease, Soldier, requires you to pacify five members of the militia while disguised as the exterminator. Two NPCs just outside Agent 47's suite can be heard discussing the cultists and how they've brought their own private security crew, the militia behind the hotel. The cult types are a bit high-strung, huh? Tell me about it. I heard they even brought their own security along. There are armed mercenaries or something in the rear courtyard. Real menacing types, too. I'm not going back there. <laughs> as if our guys aren't good enough. Weirdos. Just as Nabazov enters the exhibit floor, one NPC will start complaining about the stay at the hotel specifically mentioning the events of Club 27, once again placing this mission just a few days later. How long do you think they're going to keep doing this? God, this hotel is the worst. First, that rock star, 
then that time when we all knocked all the conscious mind gas leak, and now this! Well After you've taken both targets out, you can exit the level. As you approach one of the level's exits, Diana notices a huge spike in network traffic coming from the hotel, a series of automated messages being broadcast to locations around the globe. That's peculiar. I just saw a spike in traffic from the hotel's network. Looks like a series of automatically dispatched messages. I'll get a team on it right away. This directly leads to the next mission in the campaign, the author. The mission briefings for the rest of the Patient Zero campaign pull double duty, as both cutscenes with Diana describing the next mission to 47, and then the standard mission briefings we've come to expect. 47 is on a private jet flying away from Bangkok when Diana discovers what the surge in network traffic was. A series of automated messages sent to locations around the world, functioning as a kill switch, activating a ring of cultist sleeper agents around the globe, and ordering them to begin the bioweapon attack. 47, Diana here. Listen closely. We've got an emergency on our hands. I'll have to brief you en route. Improvisation is part of the craft. Go on. When we eliminated the targets in Bangkok, it appears we misjudged what the cult was capable of. I misjudged it. This should be interesting. Yes. Well... I'm afraid eliminating Nabazov activated a ring of sleeper agents. My current theory is that the network signal spike in Bangkok was a go signal. Something automated. A kill swing? Who are the targets? So far, we've identified two cult members meeting in Sapienza to exchange a viral weapon. Something, and I quote, apocalyptic. The client asks us to eliminate them both and extract them. There are three agents who need to be taken out, each of whom are going to try to disperse the virus on their own. Even one of these targets succeeding would be catastrophic, and so the first of these targets can be found in Sapienza, an author named Craig Black, who is the author of the world-famous series of books Cassandra Snow, a young adult supernatural romance action series clearly meant to evoke Twilight. Black is secretly also a radicalized member of the Liberation Cult. Craig Black's bio in the mission briefing says the following. He was seduced into Nabazov's cult while researching a book on the seductive nature of cults. The Source was the only mission in the Patient Zero campaign that played strictly like your typical Hitman mission. The other three all have weird gimmicks associated with them. The gimmick to the author is that Black is waiting on a meeting with the mission's secondary target, Brother Akram. This meeting is scheduled to take place at the stroke of midnight, and we'll see Brother Akram hand over a sample of the virus to Craig Black. Once Craig Black has the virus, he will escape the level. If this happens, then you'll fail the mission, putting a strict time limit on the level. In order to succeed, you must kill Craig Black, kill Brother Akram, and retrieve the virus sample being carried by one of the targets. Unlike the source, in which the entire map was still available, the author is set in a limited version of the Sapienza map, with only the town portion of the map accessible. All entrances into the Caruso estate have been blocked off. Most of the town remains untouched, with the biggest difference being that it's late at night in Sapienza, and the streets are nearly empty. Many of the stores that were open in World of Tomorrow, like The Butcher, are now closed. The only one which remains open is the ice cream shop, on the ground floor of the town hall. On the beach, instead of tourists sunbathing, you can find a few people sitting on towels, playing guitar, and just hanging out. It's very similar to the change made to the front of the school in A House Built on Sand, and once again, I really like it. One major change is that one of the apartments in town, the one which previously belonged to a member of Caruso's security team, is now the home of Brother Akram, and is full of ritualistic markings, as Brother Akram has been practicing the cult's rituals. Huh. This is most likely the place. Brother Akram must be using this apartment as a base. He seems... dedicated. You can find a picture of Nabazov, the cult's leader, directly next to Brother Akram's bed in a place of reverence, and can find a copy of his book on the table. The other major change is to the church. It's the setting of a Cassandra Snow book signing and reading. It's set up with promotional posters and review quotes for Cassandra Snow Book 5, The New England Wiccan. There are also glass cases holding roses, straight out of Beauty and the Beast. Two wireframe bodies hang above the book reading, which I really like. 
Unfortunately, they're stationary objects. I wish you could shoot them down and drop them on Black to kill him. It would make them a little more consequential. They're pretty easy to miss as it is. Down below, the crypt has been converted into the set for a photo shoot, full of AV equipment, SFX crew, and the set itself with a small well in front of a tombstone and some bushes. That's pretty much it for significant changes to the map, so what about the targets? Brother Akram is the less interesting of the two targets. He is very similar to Nabazov in the previous mission, seemingly a true believer, wearing the cult's uniform and performing the same rituals we see Nabazov perform earlier. His apartment in the town is the biggest piece of characterization we get, showing his insane and violent dedication to the cult. Craig Black, on the other hand, is characterized as a frustrated writer, dissatisfied with the Cassandra Snow series, and resentful of his audience, but financially dependent on the franchise and its fans. Of course, he's still planning to commit mass murder, so he certainly deserves what Agent 47 is going to do to him. Let's talk about what, exactly, that can be. My favorite kill in the level involves a character named the Ghostly Fan. The crypt below the church has been set up for a photo shoot with Craig Black and a superfan of the Cassandra Snow books. Unfortunately, the lights are broken, and the photo shoot cannot take place until they are repaired. If you take a screwdriver to the light and disguise yourself as an SFX crew, you can easily repair the light, at which point Black will be called down to the crypt. In my favorite moment in the entire campaign, if you disguise yourself as the ghostly fan and take the superfan's place yourself, you can discover that Agent 47 is a diehard fan of the Cassandra Snow books himself, or, at the very least, knows them well enough to convincingly play the part of a superfan. So, any questions before we start shooting? Actually, yes. The first two books make it obvious that Cassandra's estranged father is the gentleman killer. The confrontation with him is set up to be her defining moment, specifically the seance at the end of book three. And then, suddenly, that turns into a poorly written reconciliation, instead of the clean break it was obviously meant to be. Care to explain yourself? Well, I'd write that one off to the creative process. Things change, you know? Let's get this thing over with, yes? Say disease. Okay, we've been immortalized. Frame it and hang it on the wall. Did you smile? Good. You take my breath away. Love. Great. There's a fog machine set up at the photo shoot, and similarly to the Bangkok map, you can pour some non-lethal insecticide into the machine, which can be found in the sewers nearby, next to Mario and Luigi. Doing so will knock out everyone in the crypt, letting you easily take Craig Black out. There are two challenges related to this portion of the game. Purify the Spirits, which requires you to drown both targets as the Ghostly Fan, and the Gravedigger, to eliminate Craig Black in the crypt, and then drag his body and bury him in an open grave in the graveyard. Two extremely similar challenges are, and the footsteps you hear, which requires you to become Brother Akram and attend the meeting in his place, and will be the last to reach your dying ear, which requires you to become Craig Black and attend the meeting in his place. The titles of these challenges refer to a line of dialogue Nabazov would repeat while speaking in front of the crowd at the art exhibit in the source. And the footsteps you hear will be the last to reach your dying ear. If you disguise yourself as Brother Akram, you'll be able to lead Black a short distance before he realizes you aren't actually the man he was supposed to meet. This gives you a chance to, hopefully, lead Black somewhere you can take him out without being noticed. If you disguise yourself as Craig Black, then Brother Akram will simply set the virus down on the railing nearby, letting you take it before walking away. One hidden challenge, called The Pen is Mightier Than the Sword, requires you to kill Craig Black with the pen he is using for the book signing. In order to do this, you must wait for Black to patrol over to the book signing table, at which point you can slam his face against the table, impaling him with the pen straight through the eye. Now, let's look at some of the details in the author. If you try to get into the book signing, you'll be asked for an invitation. Up in the restaurant next to the Sanguine store, you can find a well-known literature critic named Mike Vogt. That is renowned literature critic Mike Vogt. He will certainly have an invitation to the reading. 
Vogt was invited to the book signing, but will instead pace around the restaurant, drinking wine, and complaining about how terrible the Cassandra Snow series is. Look, I get it. You don't like Cassandra Snow. That's fine, but I really need to close up now. You know, it's rough. I mean, I love literature, but Cassandra Snow is not literature. It's, it's dross. Offensively so. I mean, I'm invited to the reading, but I will not go. I refuse to. God, kill me. By poisoning his wine with emetic poison, you can easily take Vogt out, steal his invitation, and attend the book signing yourself instead. The bio on Craig Black in the mission briefing mentions that the plan is for Black to release the virus at a Cassandra Snow convention, which is why he's being given the virus sample by the cult. This is confirmed during his dialogue when you meet with him in Brother Akram's place, when he mentions deploying the weapon at CassieCon. He also mentions that the reason for joining the cult and wanting to commit mass murder is mostly related to hating his fans, and how seriously they take his garbage books. I am ready. I really am. I... I hate them. So many questions about this stupid girl and the ghosts. This is not what I'll be remembered for. The teacher told me of his plan. I knew I wanted in. When we trigger the weapon at CassieCon, they will be touched by it, all of them. I am ready to die to take them with me. You can listen to Black reading from the Cassandra Snow novels in the church. They're paranormal romance novels akin to Twilight, where the protagonist seems to be a witch who has to choose between two ghosts as her love interest. Now let's pick it up at a different part of the story. Uh, remember, I'm still working on this. <clears throat> My heart felt like a stone inside me. The seance was going wrong. We'd begun as I expected, reaching into the immaterial world of the beyond, seeking out any sign of the shadow. This was dangerous. We were right in the heart of the Dark Coast. Constantine was a constant support, his ghostly form close at hand. His eyes, at once pale yet vibrant, promised me that he would remain with me as I journeyed into the immaterial, no matter the risk to himself. We both knew that while I could return, there would be nothing I could do to protect him from the Dark Watchers, if they found us. And found us, they had. We realized it as the shadowy world of the immaterial turned to cobwebs and whispers around us. This was it. We had gone too far, and now we would have to fight. Constantine pushed in front of me to distract their dead eyes from my living aura, and I cried out to him not to. But he was too brave to hear me, and flew at them. <clears throat> That's definitely one of the more dramatic situations they'll face in their search for the shadow. I'm still working with it, of course, but remember, Cassandra is tougher than she looks. Everyone! Mike Vogt makes fun of the premise if you listen to him long enough, saying, Not only are her lovers unthreateningly Caucasian, they're ghosts. I mean, they can't even touch her. If you want to get the targets to head to their meeting early, you can find a mechanism that controls the church's bell clock tower and press it, causing the clock to go off immediately. This is just an incredibly small technical detail I thought was neat. The lighthouse way off on an island in the distance actually casts light on the statues in the graveyard when it rotates in the correct direction. Strangely, while Craig Black is obviously allowed into the crypt to take part in the photo shoot, and while it won't be considered trespassing if you're there in the disguise, the Craig Black disguise is not allowed into the crypt by security. You can hear NPCs of the book reading discussing the Cassandra Snow novels. Well, uh, what can I say? I'm a fan but mostly of the TV series. I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing how they introduce Constantine. I don't mind listening to it again. There's always so much depth in his writing. Similarly to the icon, there are references to the Cassandra Snow novels in later missions. For example, two garbage men mention it in Whittleson Creek. He's been sitting there most of the day. I don't know what he's reading, but it looks like it's the most interesting thing he's ever come across. The new Cassandra Snow novel, maybe. Slivers of past shimmers, or something like that. See, my wife's reading it now. I can't get her to do anything around the house. 
Once Brother Akram and Craig Black have been taken out, and the virus sample has been retrieved, you'll have effectively foiled the first of the three sleeper agent plots. The next mission will take you to the second sleeper agent in Colorado. The next mission is titled The Vector, and is set in Colorado. The next target is Dr. Bradley Payne. Payne is located in a remote militia compound in Colorado. Unfortunately, he's already begun infecting unsuspecting mercenaries there with the virus, and any of the infected must be taken out along with Payne in order to prevent the virus from spreading any further. A small place for a dispersal. Maybe just a test. Or an act of desperation. We cannot allow this to spread for us. The Vector is the strangest mission in the entire campaign, perhaps in the entire series. In order to prevent Agent 47 from becoming infected, the ICA has recommended he complete the mission from long range, and so he has set up a sniper nest on a nearby radio tower, out of bounds of the original Colorado mission's map. This means that the entire mission is a sniper challenge, completely different from the rest of the game. Consequently, this mission resists my regular treatment pretty substantially, since there really isn't any dialogue to overhear or environmental details to enjoy. The mission is very interesting though, and from a gameplay perspective, I really enjoy it. Along with Payne, there are four infected militia members who must be taken out somewhere in the compound. Who those four targets are is randomized, and they aren't marked in red the same way Payne is. Instead, Diana will read out a series of hints about each target. Your target is at the shooting range, your target is working as a chef in the mess, your target is suffering from nausea, and so on. Here we go, 47. The target is assigned to the mess. Look for someone cooking in the field kitchen. Wait one second, 47, I have an update. Someone on a laptop, 47. The target is currently playing a game of legendary battle lords and not doing well. Have you located him? That's the first infected target eliminated, 47. I'll have information on the next one momentarily. It is then up to you to observe the behavior of the characters in the level and determine which one is your target. This is a really neat idea, and it adds a surprising amount of replay value to one of the shortest missions in the entire game. This sort of sniper-only mission, minus the hint system, would be expanded upon and turned into a full-on minigame with three maps solely dedicated to it, with the Sniper Assassin missions in Hitman 2, but I think the extra wrinkle of having to observe to determine who your target actually is makes this mission fun in an entirely different way from those. Diana suggests waiting to take Payne out last, but honestly, you don't need to. There's no real difference between taking him out last and taking him out first, something which I feel the mission could have found something interesting to do with, since they do gesture towards it. There's really no characterization to speak of for pain or any of the targets in the level, so let's move on and discuss how the level actually plays out. Despite the mission being sniper only, there's still strategy involved, as well as a few different options for taking targets out. You can shoot them, of course, but if you do so in plain sight, it's likely to cause a panic, and if you miss, it could even cause a target to try to evacuate. Shooting at the right time can knock a target's body into a bush or pile of hay, hiding their body long enough for you to complete the mission undetected. There are also plenty of accident kills available here, especially by shooting explosives directly next to a target. This will not raise suspicion either. The challenges in this level aren't so much interesting ways to kill targets as they are gameplay objectives to try to challenge you to replay the mission for a better score. For completion's sake, I'll quickly run them down. Brain Detail complete the vector by eliminating every target with a headshot. Where is everybody? Complete the vector by hiding the bodies of all targets. Unsafe work environment. Complete the vector by eliminating all targets in accidents. Environmentalist. Eliminate all targets with ballistic kills using precisely five bullets and without missing a shot. The one that almost got away. Eliminate an escaping target. Quicker than the eye. Eliminate each infected target before Diana delivers her last hint about them. Once Payne and the four infected mercenaries have been taken out, you can quickly exit the level through a hatch. You've taken out two of the three sleeper agents now, which just leaves the final mission of the campaign, the titular mission, Patient Zero.
The final mission of the Patient Zero campaign, itself titled Patient Zero, is set on the Hokkaido map. The last sleeper agent is a man named Owen Cage, and he's believed to be the one behind the development of the virus in the first place. He was attempting to travel to Sydney, Australia, when he raised the suspicion of local authorities during a stopover in Japan, performing his strange cult rituals. When the authorities realized he was displaying signs of illness, they shipped him off to the Gama facility in Hokkaido, where he has been quarantined. Owen Cage infected himself with the virus in a desperate attempt to cause it to spread, hoping to become Patient Zero. Now, he's being observed in Japan by an ether research scientist named Dr. Klaus Lieblied. Lieblied is attempting to study the virus as much as possible before Cage dies, and given what we've already seen Ether attempt to do with one virus in the Sapienza map, it goes without saying that this cannot be allowed. As such, Lieblied must also be taken out, as your secondary target. The gimmick to this mission, however, is that other NPCs within the mission can be exposed to the virus. If that happens, then in order to ensure containment, that NPC must also be taken out, becoming an essential target for mission completion as well. Of course, whatever NPC gets infected can also infect other NPCs, who will then become targets as well. If you're not quick about it, then the mission can easily become a bloodbath, requiring you to murder half the facility or more. It also means that you need to keep NPC behavior in mind even more than usual. For example, at one point I had a problem where a pair of security guards were the first NPCs becoming infected, even though their patrol routes didn't lead into the hospital or near Cage at all. I eventually realized what was causing this was that I had taken out another guard, completely unseen, but had forgotten to pick up his weapon. When one of the guards saw his weapon lying on the ground, he picked it up and moved it to a secure location inside of the hospital, which led to him becoming infected, spreading the virus outside of the hospital much faster than I'd anticipated. Instead of beginning in Tobias Reaper's suite, you begin by infiltrating the mountain path underneath the helipad. This means that, unlike the regular Hokkaido mission, your default suit will be trespassing anywhere in the facility. The resort portion of the map is mostly unchanged. Some NPCs can be heard throughout discussing the quarantine at the hospital. I can't believe this. They had better compensate me or there's a lawsuit incoming. They didn't let you in for the checkup? No. Apparently there's been an unfortunate incident of some sort. Whole section is under quarantine. I mean, seriously, how bad can it be? I'm sure it will blow over quickly. It had better. I need to get back home soon. If I don't get a doctor's signature on that medical report, I'll have to cover the costs of this stay myself. I'll be ruined. You heard the rumor about the lockdown too? No. Apparently, something got loose deeper in the hospital. And they've closed off an entire section. I tried to go there, but there were guards turning the guests away, so... Well, that doesn't sound very good. Any idea what it could be? No, but I could swear I saw someone wearing a big suit, like an environment suit or something. I've got a bad feeling about this. And NPC placements have generally been changed, but for the most part, it is the same. Perhaps the biggest change is that the only suite still occupied is Amos Dexter's, as the other three suites have all been turned over, or are not yet occupied, depending on whether the mission is meant to take place before or after the events of Cytus and Versus. Yuki Yamazaki's suite is actively being cleaned by resort staff. The hospital, on the other hand, has been fully converted. It's under strict quarantine, and plastic sheets have blocked off the bottom floor of the hospital. If you want to access this quarantine zone, you'll have to be wearing a hazmat suit or a bodyguard disguise. The operating theater is once again the main focus, which is set up for examinations of Owen Cage. What was previously the surgery control room now houses a button in case incineration is required for containment, which will activate flame jets burning Owen Cage to death. When Cage is not being examined by Liebleid in the operating theater, he's being kept in the ICU area, which has been heavily quarantined and is filled with doctors wearing hazmat suits. A few other rooms have been converted, such as the defibrillator control room, which is entirely empty now. Kai's mainframe room is still accessible, but the switches you would pull on the server racks are no longer there, and Kai does not have a presence in the mission. The director is locked in his office, working non-stop throughout the mission this time. What used to be the stem cell control room in Cytus and Versus now houses a safe containing a lethal injection, which Liebleid holds the key to. In the morgue, the stem cell storage room has been repurposed to store a vaccine for the Nabazov virus. 
Because of the highly contagious nature of the virus, if you get too close to an infected NPC, Agent 47 can catch the virus himself. What? 47, I... You're infected. You will need to find a solution for that. If this happens, you'll be given a five minute countdown, and must reach the vaccine and take it in order to cure yourself. Once you've been vaccinated, you will be immune to the Navazov virus. You can't get it again, so it might be worth your time to head straight for the stem cell storage room and take the vaccine right at the start of the mission, in order to prevent Agent 47 from becoming infected. The other problem with becoming infected is, just like the NPCs in the level, you will spread the virus to any NPC you come in contact with. And you move a lot more and a lot faster than any NPC does, which means you'll cause the infection to spread way more quickly than you realize if you do so. The gimmick of the virus spreading in this mission, mixed with the fact that you start without any sort of disguise in a hostile area like you did in Colorado, and the enforcers in the level being placed in tough spots, means that this mission is very difficult. In fact, I would go so far as to say that not only is this mission by far the hardest portion of the Patient Zero campaign, it's the hardest mission in the first game overall, a final exam for all of your skills built up over the course of the previous missions, requiring speed, skill, and careful strategy in order to complete the mission without it snowballing into a complete bloodbath. As for the targets, Owen Cage is in the very late stages of the virus, and has become delirious. He looks like he's on death's door, and can barely make it from the ICU to the examination room. Klaus Lieblied, meanwhile, is characterized as a complete monster. You can hear him discuss the virus if you eavesdrop on him during the mission, and even hear him discuss plans on how to alter it to turn it into a more effective weapon for Ether's purposes. Hmm. Outer symptoms not quite as dramatic as EHF. Onset time is amazing, though. Patient has been infected for less than a day, and the virus has obviously managed to ravage his body with a speed unlike anything I've seen before. I need to address that in the lab eventually. Cannot allow it to burn out too quickly. It's astounding. The onset time for this virus is simply off the charts. I'll need to compensate for that somehow. Engineer the virus to replicate at a slower rate, perhaps. The team in Shanghai worked on that. I should talk to Deval once I've returned. You can find journals written by Liebli discussing the virus. One mentioning that the virus seems to be designed to take out heavily populated urban areas while leaving rural communities mostly unaffected, and another revealing that Liebleed's vaccine is something he creates for personal use, to make sure he remained unaffected by the virus while studying it. Owen Cage is a monster, but he's a very sick, very pathetic monster by the time we see him in the mission. Well done, Mr. Cage. That's all we need for now. Let's go back to the room until we need you again. Yes. Yes. Rest. I, I, I need to rest. But my flight, did I, did I miss it? I'll take care of everything, Mr. Cage. Don't worry. Klaus Liebleid is a very academic monster, one completely lacking empathy. Liebleid is a version of Silvio Caruso who isn't limited by a fragile psyche, and who seems to enjoy the idea of mass murder for the sake of it, especially when he knows he's protected and being well paid. Let's talk about how the mission itself plays out. One challenge called Needlework requires you to disguise yourself as Liebleid and then kill Cage with a lethal injection during his examination. Once you're disguised as Liebleid, I couldn't find a way to trigger Cage to start patrolling back over to the examination room, so the only way I was able to do this was by waiting until Liebleid had called Cage to the examination room and then killing him and taking his disguise while Cage was on the move. My favorite way of killing Cage and Liebleid in the level is by sneaking into the control room for the incineration protocol and waiting until Cage is being examined. Liebleid will step into range of the flame jets and you can take them both out in one go. Muscle joints swelling up. <laughs> This will be considered an accident kill, and can be used for Silent Assassin, and will award the Inferno challenge. Two complementary challenges in the mission are Containment, which asks you to complete the mission without any additional NPCs becoming infected, and on the clear other end of things, you know the number, a hidden challenge which requires you to let at least 47 people get infected, and still complete the mission. 
One challenge in the mission, titled No Rubber, requires you to complete the entire mission without ever wearing a hazmat suit. This isn't difficult from an infection perspective, as you can fairly easily get into the vaccine room and get immunity to the virus without needing a hazmat suit, but accessing the lower floor of the hospital where both of your primary targets spend their time requires either a hazmat suit or a bodyguard disguise, greatly limiting your opportunities within the mission. One hidden challenge called Lucky Shot requires you to get infected and then inject yourself with the vaccine with one second left on the countdown. The bodyguards in the level defending the hospital are not very thrilled with not being provided hazmat suits, as you can hear from the ones on the helipad shortly after starting the level. Not this again, surely. How can you not be concerned? If this thing is contagious, we should be wearing one of those suits. I'm not bothered. I've got an ironclad immune system. Ever since I became a vegan, I haven't had a sick day, not one. I'm pretty sure some flesh-eating virus isn't going to pass you over because of your diet. Whatever. You can hear two other bodyguards at the hospital entrance from the garden discuss this as well. They do look uncomfortable, those hazard suits. I'm kind of glad we didn't get one now. Absolutely. Can you imagine hitting on the nurses in one of those? <laughs> silly. I'm totally silly. You can hear two of the doctors wearing hazmat suits in the hospital's quarantined zone discussing the same thing. These suits are pretty awesome, huh? Yeah. Anytime someone asks me to wear one of these, I get worried. I mean, it can't just be for show, right? You worry too much. Besides, if you're right, then you're lucky to be wearing one. Nothing gets through this bad boy. Well, it makes you wonder why everyone isn't wearing one, doesn't it? I'm sure it's just to avoid spreading panic. Or something. Although there's really no reason to do it, you can still go into the organ vault and destroy the right-sided donor heart from Cytus and Versus, just for giggles. Two doctors in the ICU can be heard discussing Cage's history as a virologist. Sure, I read a few of his papers. Botanics and spores mostly, but also virus research. Shame to see him like this. I wonder what happened to him. I heard he broke under the pressure. Got involved with a cult or some nonsense. Real shame. Once Klaus Liebled and Owen Cage are down, along with any other additional infected, you can exit the mission, completing the campaign. Very well done, 47. Owen Cage and Klaus Liebled are both dead, and the Nabazov virus has no chance to spread. I've relayed the information to the board. They offer their congratulations. We'll speak again shortly. With the last sleeper agent handled, and Ether no longer being able to get their hands on the Nabazov virus, the crisis is finally contained. You're treated to one last brief cutscene wrapping up the Patient Zero campaign as a whole. I've finished the final operations report for the client. And the weaponized virus? Destroyed. I supervised it. This was a close-run thing, 47. Nabazov's plan was brilliant. This is beyond the work of a cult. This is tradecraft. Indeed. Of course, as far as the ICA is concerned, the contract is closed. Sounds like you have some work ahead of you before I get involved. I have to go. I've acquired the target. Diana and 47 agree that this situation was beyond the work of a cult, and there may be another presence behind all of it. Agent 47 says that Diana should continue investigating, and hangs up on her, preparing to take out his next target. That's the end of the Patient Zero campaign. The cutscene at the end feels like they wanted to write themselves a potential loose end so that they could continue this storyline as DLC for later installments, but at least as of the time of writing, they still haven't followed this thread up at all to the best of my knowledge, with the DLC for the second and third game being wholly unrelated. Maybe they'll follow up on it someday, otherwise, I don't know, just assume Providence did it, I guess. In terms of motivation, this stands in contrast to the bonus missions we've seen so far, in that this is the most explicitly heroic we've ever seen Agent 47 act. The other bonus missions we've talked about so far are strictly about 47 and Diana getting paid. The main missions blur that line further, as the targets in the main game are more inherently villainous, but the bulk of the first game is still about taking out targets in order to get paid. Then eventually the final two missions are motivated by revenge towards the Shadow Client and Soders, respectively. Our protagonists are technically being paid to stop the Nabazov virus as well, but this is a story where Diana and Agent 47 are saving the world. They are heroes in this story, not anti-heroes or morally grey. The Patient Zero campaign is not something I see mentioned very often in the context of these games. 
The bonus content in general tends to get overlooked, perhaps with the exception of the icon, which is why I wanted to make sure to give all of the bonus missions a look over the course of this series. They aren't as exciting or perfect as the main levels in the game, but they offer a chance to explore ideas that might not warrant a full level. If what you want out of bonus missions is weird other takes on what Hitman can be, then the Patient Zero campaign is for you. This is the most experimental content released for the entire trilogy, which is by far the most compelling reason to play it. Some of the ideas in this campaign would be refined or recontextualized in different levels later on. For example, characters switching their routines partway through the mission like Sister Gilduz does is something which becomes more standard as the series goes on, and can be seen in missions like Miami in Hitman 2, where Sierra Knox starts the mission on the racetrack and will only appear in person once the race has concluded. Sniper-only missions have been done before in the series, and would later be turned into the Sniper Assassin minigame in Hitman 2. Your targets being unmarked, and the player needing to identify them by carefully observing the behavior of the NPCs in the level, is the whole premise of the Berlin level in Hitman 3. In terms of the actual levels themselves, the extent of the conversions done to them, the stories and personalities of the targets, and the breadth of ways to take targets out, I think a house built on sand and the icon are both better than any of the Patient Zero content. However, in terms of experimental design, levels that found gimmicks to make them play completely differently from anything else in the trilogy, Patient Zero is unmatched, and it's worth giving the campaign a playthrough if you've overlooked it, if only to experience the weird gimmicks, especially in the Vector and the Patient Zero mission itself. We've almost completed our look at the first game in the World of Assassination trilogy, but before we can move on to Hitman 2, we still need to examine the last two bonus missions I haven't talked about yet. Landslide, set on the Sapienza map, and Holiday Hoarders, set in Paris. Next time, I'll talk about these last two pieces of bonus content, and conclude my discussion of Hitman 2016.